Dr. Asim Alhotra is an internationally recognized clinician, researcher, and health advocate who has become a prominent voice in the fight against obesity and the myriad health issues it engenders. Graduating as a cardiologist from the esteemed University of London, his medical journey evolved from treating patients to actively advocating for preventative measures, primarily through lifestyle and dietary changes. Dr. Malhotra has extensively critiqued the pharmaceutical industry industry's influence on medical practice and is renowned for his campaigns against excessive sugar consumption and its detrimental effects on public health. With numerous published research papers and articles to his name, he is a sought-after speaker, appearing on media platforms to educate the public about nutrition and health. In addition to his clinical and advocacy work, Dr. Malhotra serves as a testament to the power of evidence-based nutrition and lifestyle modifications. He is not only an authoritative figure in the realm of cardiology, but also a beacon of hope for many, advocating for systematic changes in the healthcare world. His relentless pursuit of transparency in healthcare and dedication to patient welfare has garnered him respect and recognition globally, positioning him at the forefront of a revolution in modern medicine. A theme I could not be more privileged, honored, and proud to have you here. Welcome. Karen, it's always good to chat with you. <laughs> I mean, you are literally one of my best friends, without a doubt, and one of the people who I look up to the most in this space because you are relentless in your pursuit of going after the truth and exposing it. You know, you always put that ahead of any personal gain, and I have seen that firsthand. Your latest um, documentary that you're working on is called First Do No Farm. Let's start there. What is that about? Yeah, Karen. So um, 2015, in fact, not long after we met, uh, in fact, actually through... It's interesting, this journey, because it does link to you, actually, in many ways, <laughs> where we go with the documentary. So 2015, I think, was the low-carb yeah. convention yep. in Cape Town, right? Yep. Which you were you were, you were were the main, I mean, the chief sort of organizer, yeah. if you like, for that. Um, and I remember you reaching out to me, and it was a very quick yes when you asked me to come and speak. And uh, obviously, we became very good friends there And uh, from then. Um, and at that actual conference is when I first met Donald O'Neill. Uh, former international athlete, documentary filmmaker, you know, his specialism is in uh, health and performance. And he had already, I'd already loved his first documentary, uh, Serial Killers, and, and yeah. I helped support, get some of the attention around that in the British press and, and British media. Um, and then Donal actually had an idea that we do a, a film together called The Big Fat Fix, which was really to try and understand how the cholesterol hypothesis had um uh, evolved into something that you know is, is more nuanced but essentially means that a lot of people have an unnecessary fear of cholesterol uh, you know related to my work and then also to look into the secrets of longevity based upon this village in southern Italy called Piopi uh, which is kind of the home of the with the Mediterranean diet movement so uh, that's where things sort of begun and then you know obviously lots of lots of things have happened since then um, but more recently when I was in South Africa again uh, on a speaking tour um, uh, I, uh, in February, Donald came to one of my talks at the beginning and, uh, I was staying with him and his wife, Louise, uh, anyway, awesome. but he said, he straight away had an idea. He just watched my talk and said, there's another movie here. And, uh, Donald's great with sound bites. Um, you know, that, that's his idea, you know, the, the title of, and I, I said straight away, it's brilliant. First do no farm really to try and help people understand how medical knowledge is under commercial control. And the people who are, or the entity that is controlling that information at, the, at its root is Big Pharma. Uh, you can apply this to nutrition, nutrition advice as well, but in more, you know, Big Pharma, I think right now, um, their excesses and their, uh, uh, in terms of um, their manipulations uh, over information, over the unchecked power they have is, in my view, a huge threat to healthcare. Um, it's a threat to people's mental and social well-being. It's a threat to democracy. And therefore, through the documentary, you want to kind of unravel all of these issues relating to Big Pharma, but also give people solutions moving forward. So that's kind of where we're at right now. What are some of the biggest issues that you have identified through the extensive work that you've done in the space? Well, actually, you know, it's very straightforward, to be honest, um, Karen. The, the, the biggest issue is the fact that we have too many people 
with financial conflicts of interest, again, rooted in the economic system, to be honest, making decisions over health and health policy. And what that means is that people are getting biased and corrupted information. It's not open. It's not fully transparent. It's not complete. It's therefore um, you're not true in many cases. And, uh, and, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that's going to have a negative impact on people's health. And that's really the root of the problem. So what we need to do moving forward is remove those commercial conflicts of interest. So drug industry, for example, when they conduct clinical trials, most you know, re medical research now is sponsored by the drug industry. Um, they control the data. They don't allow it to be independently verified and checked. They then pay the regulators to regulate them, which is kind of, uh, you know, sort of counterintuitive. Fox is guarding the hen coop. And then what happens is clinical guideline boards and doctors receive information published in medical journals through drug and sponsored research, which is often false. I mean, I'm not, this is not an exaggeration. Somebody who I describe as a Stephen Hawking like figure in medicine, Professor John Ioannidis from the University of Stanford. Yes. Um, it's the most cited medical researcher in the world. In 2006, he published a paper in PLOS One, which was called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. Yeah. So, uh, and, in, and in one of the things he mentions in that paper, is the greater, the greater the financial or other prejudices and interests in a given field, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Most people, the reason why this system, uh, these system failures continue, um, Karen, though, is because most doctors are unaware of this. They're unaware of the poor quality research that's driving their clinical decision making. It's not because most people are malicious, most people are malevolent, most people are trying to exploit others for money. It's not because of that. It's at the root of it is the system, the economic system we're in. Something that's described as a free market is not a free market. It hasn't been a free market, I think, for a very long time. It's a freedom to deceive market, which in essence means they're going to lead to market failure on a very basic level because people are spending money and wasting money on drugs, for example, that have very little benefit. They're not fully informed about the harms. Um, and of course, there are safer, simpler options and cheaper options um, to help manage many of these chronic diseases, which, again, separate to the pharma debate and linked to it, though, is what we initially, you know, when we connected, we uh, yeah. what we discussed in detail is the whole chronic disease that's being driven by unhealthy exposures. I think we have to get the narrative right on this. It isn't. We talk about lifestyle. It suggests it's personal responsibility mainly. Of course, we have a role in personal responsibility. But Karen, most of what drives people's behavior is actually related to the built environment. Uh, what determines their health is socially determined. So what does that mean? It's conditions in which we are born, grow, live, work, and age. And again, that's not something that's very well acknowledged by the medical profession, but it's just that those are the facts. So it doesn't mean we don't have personal responsibility to be part of that and we can't educate people and empower them. But ultimately, if we're going to improve population health, it needs to be through structural changes as well. Even simple things like, you know, are people getting a fair pay? Um, we know very good quality research now that tells us that if you're in a high demand, low pay, low control job, which I suspect, I suspect is million, you know, uh, applies to millions of Americans, it's effectively a death sentence. So how have we allowed this to happen? Well, again, you come back to the issues around the big corporations and the power they exert. Um, you know, the economic system in many ways for many of these companies, um, what they do is in order to maximize their profits, they often pay their workers a low amount the lowest amount as possible that they can pay them. But that low pay, as well as having a detrimental effect on people's mental uh, health, is also going to have an effect on their physical health as well, both directly and indirectly. For example, you know, we want to create a society where everybody has the opportunity to live the life that they can lead, especially when it comes to fulfilling basic needs of affording um, healthy food. Yeah. You know, very simple stuff. So I think for me, a lot of what we're going to try and expose or discuss and educate people through this documentary is also on these issues as well. Like, fine, pharma is a terrible entity as, a, as an industry. Um, I have described it as psychopathic as an entity, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that, uh, on the back of, uh, you know, the book, The Corporation and the documentary, which was made by law professor Joel Bacan. Um, uh, but you know, people need to also understand that the, there is a, um, a better alternative, you know, so it's about empowering people. It's not just highlighting the problems and the solutions, but it's also giving people, uh, an understanding of other things, you know, which are, you know, in, in their, um, you know, which, which may sound relatively simple when, when it comes back, when it comes down to things like, and I know you understand this very well about eating real food, moderate activity, keeping stress levels in check, but actually 
the environment we live in is increasingly making it harder for people to actually live a healthy life. Asim, it seems that you are taking on the most mammoth task in the universe. And I understand that this film is... I mean, what you've been doing since I've known you has been phenomenal and monumental in so many ways. Um, if you're not going to focus on, so you mentioned that it's not the doctors, right? It's not the doctors that are at fault. It's that they just don't know. How can doctors better educate themselves to avoid being influenced by pharmaceutical representatives or industry funded research? Well, I think there are multiple me mechanisms, um, Karen. Uh, you know, this is about disseminating the right, correct, the greater truths, if you like, to as many people as possible, including doctors. So the way we do that, of course, is through um, media. Um, one, I think one of the problems is that mainstream media itself has been very much influenced and captured by these big corporations as well. Yeah. So a lot of the information people are receiving on their health is, again, curated deliberately for the purposes of allowing... Um, you know, a minority uh, of people and big industries to make profit. So I think, you know, it is about disseminating this information. And what we try and do is through different mechanisms. It can be through, you know, in my, for example, in my particular role, I, I try and do it through different ways, whether it's through giving lectures to a small group of people, hoping there'll be a ripple effect. It's through social media. It's through mainstream media when I've had the opportunity, which I've had, uh, been privileged to have uh, and probably will continue to have certainly for the last decade. Um, and uh, and it's just making sure that all of us as individuals, once you become empowered with this information, you don't just sit on it. You know, one of the things I, I say in my talks is knowledge without action is vanity. Action without knowledge is insanity, but wisdom without courage is fruitless. It's a waste of time. So it also means you know, and, and this is also linked, Karen, actually to helping us understand what it actually truly means to be human. And one of the things that's happened with this culture, we've actually corporatized human beings as well because of these system failures. And corporatization of human beings is very anti-human. It, it has a detrimental effect of mental and physical health. It's not good for a cohesive, collective, um, collaborative society, which is actually what we need more than ever. So there are different ways, um, you know, that we can we can achieve these end goals to improve the system and improve people's mental, physical, and social well-being. Um, but you know what I'm doing, like many others, I mean, I just see myself as a medium for a collective message. Is just to keep hammering that, keep moving forward, um, you know, uh, as 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 strong as possible, um, and, and being aware there will be pushback, there will be attacks. But I think as if people genuinely act on what they know to be right in their hearts, I think that in itself should be empowering enough for them to just be able to just crack on, you know, and uh, and because the alternative, Karen, is to stay silent, right? You know, Jordan Peterson says it's not safe to speak the truth, and he's right, but it's less safe to not speak the truth because the problem's not going to go away. It's only going to get worse. And if you're not doing it for yourself, at least it for your kids or your grandkids or future generations, um, because they are going to be inheriting a world that we have in many ways given them and um you know uh, if you're not part of the solution then i would say then we are, if we if we are not part of the solution we are part of the problem and there will be no solution gosh it's devastating um you you know you talk a lot about over medication as well and so shifting from the doctor's perspective to the patient perspective how can patients better protect themselves from the potential harm caused by over medication or unnecessary treatments and like the the fraudulent research and everything else yeah uh, great question karen actually so there's a paper i wrote um i helped coordinate a campaign between the british medical journal and the academy of medical royal colleges in the uk in 2015. the academy of medical royal colleges is essentially represented every doctor in the uk and that was through a a paper where i was lead author on it uh, published in the bmj called choosing wisely the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges initiative to wind back the harms of too much medicine. And in that, we actually take some questions that every patient should ask their doctor from this campaign called Choosing Wisely, which originally started in Canada. And these include things like, you know, do I really need this test procedure or drug? What happens if I do nothing? Are there simpler, safer options? Um, you know, and actually asking patients, uh, their doctor, what are the benefits and harms in absolute terms? And if those questions are, if every patient is aware of those questions and asks their doctor, then I think it becomes 
that they're more likely to be fully informed when it comes to making, you know, uh, a decision about taking a medication or going for a surgery or even adopting a lifestyle intervention. The problem is a lot of doctors themselves aren't even equipped with um, a training or a confidence to actually practice what we call, this may sound very strange here, what I describe as ethical evidence-based medicine. Right? So evidence-based medicine basically is, you know, an elegant, um, you know, uh, concept that was developed by Professor David Sackett, the late Professor David Sackett, Canadian epidemiologist. Um, and it was originally conceived and published in the BMJ in 1996. So you're talking about almost 30 years ago. And it's a, a framework for teaching practicing medicine. And the framework, basically, the purpose of the framework is to improve patient outcomes, which means managing risks, treating illness, and relieving suffering. But to do that properly, you need to use your clinical experience, your knowledge, your intuition, the best available evidence on a particular drug or lifestyle intervention or surgery or test. But last but not least, most importantly, to, to take into consideration patient preferences and values, which is basically informed consent. Well, if you break it down properly and you look at the research on this informed decision making, studies have shown that actually very few doctors, if any, actually fulfill criteria for informed, proper, true informed consent with patients. Like, can you even think about that for a second? Oh. So that is, again, the heart of the problem. So this is a cultural issue. This is an issue of training. And that, again, needs to happen through education, through postgraduate training. It's not rocket science. I've had to learn to do this myself. Yeah, it's not something I was conditioned to do in medical school. I've evolved in my own practice, but really adhere to those principles. Um, and, uh, you know, patients feel more empowered. Um, they feel more confident about the decisions they're making. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, I think it is the right way to improve their outcomes. So, you know, that's I think that's the way forward. I mean, actually, you know, it sounds strange, but the solution to the healthcare crisis is the practice of ethical evidence-based medicine. I love that. I absolutely freaking love that. I love that, the, the name. I love the way you described it. And um, I love that you're fighting for this. So this is airing October 21st. You are doing a talk with RFK Jr., Dr. Drew. Um, I forget the, the fourth person. Um, you're Vandana doing, Shiva, Dr. Vandana Shiva. And you're doing a panel on chronic disease at San Jose Civic Center. Tell us more about that. Yeah, really excited about that, Karen, because I think for me, all of these, um, you know, the, in terms of dissemination of the truth and information, uh, you know, this is a great platform for it. So there is an event, um, you know, which with, a, with several thousand capacity venues, San Jose Civic, 28th of October in the afternoon on Saturday. Um, tickets are actually, by the time this airs, of course, um, tickets will be on sale. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm hoping it will be sold out by then, but if not, then people please <laughs> check oh, in. I'll be there uh, as well. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, but, you know, uh, in fact, this will be announced by the time you air it, uh, is that we will also live stream it. So there are people that can uh, click on links that hopefully will be available then and we'll live stream it around the world. And the actual title of the event is Ending Corruption and Chronic Disease. Um, so um, it will, it, we will actually give a big overview of the issues of the health crisis in the US and even other parts of the world in relation to big food, big pharma, help people understand w why we are where we are, how we got here, but also then give people those solutions moving forward. And I think it's going to be very eye opening for many, many, many people, including doctors. So um, I think the combination of people with myself, I mean, this has been over a decade of my kind of work um, into health policy and system failures and evolving science of heart disease and the barriers to those productive, positive changes. Um, but of course, for me, the, the, the person that stands out as the political leader in the world by far, that I think is well equipped to be able to understand these issues and to help implement those policy changes you know, that are going to be democratic and ethical and scientific is Robert Kennedy Jr. Tell us about First Union Farm and how we can support that documentary and being made because it is independent. It isn't, yeah. right? Yeah. Thanks, Karen. No, of course. Yeah. So it, we're, like with Big Fat Fix, it's been crowdfunded. Um, we've got some amazing people that we have already interviewed in the UK and we're interviewing more people in the US, you know, very eminent names in science and medicine, um, also in the lifestyle medicine space as well. And, um, you know, we ideally need to get, you know, because we want to keep it free from commercial influence so that it's, you know, the bias is reduced as much as possible. So people get really the full truthful picture of what's going on. 
and therefore for the crowdfunding to make a very high quality of documentary. And this is actually still quite low budget. We need about half a million dollars. So we're, at yeah. the moment, we're still about 350K short yeah. uh, of getting to that target. But if we can get to that target, then we're going to be able to produce something very, very high quality. I think the other good news is as well, of course, I'm, you know, I try multiple channels to disseminate this information. You know, I, 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 yeah. I believe in conversations at health policy level. So I speak to politicians. I'm lucky to meet people around the world. I have, you know, people on WhatsApp that I can, uh, you know, share yeah. my, my views with who are people even involved in government. So we will, but, you know, um, one of the things that will happen is, uh, you know, it's already being said is that Joe Rogan, who interviewed me a few months ago, said that he's going to promote it as well when it's out. So we've got a great opportunity here and I'd love people to be part of it. So if people want to contribute um, anything that they can afford, um, then they can go to the website, which is nofarmfilm.com, N-O-P-H-A-R-M, film, F-I-L-M.com. Um, but of course, we will hope to get some larger funders coming in as well. Fantastic. And that will all be linked below. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Asim. I am, oh, I just, I feel so energized. Anytime I speak with you, I love being on this mission with you. Um, I mean, I am here to support you every step of the way. Thank you, Carol. Okay. COVID vaccine? Uh, let's start with the COVID vaccine. Uncensored. Un just tell us about the COVID vaccine and, and the lack of informed consent. Yeah, so I mean, Karen, I'm uh, a big supporter, if you like, of the benefits of traditional vaccines, even though I've been somebody who's been very aware of the excesses and manipulations of pharma. Um, traditional vaccines themselves, compared to all the other drugs we prescribe or pharmacolo pharmacological interventions, have been proven to be very, very safe, but have gone through rigorous testing and, and trials over five to 10 years before they fully get approved. Um, I've got uh, and many scars on my left arm really to prove that. I mean, I was oh my born God. in India. I've got, I've got smallpox, you know, TBCG, TB, all that stuff. I've had many vaccines. I therefore could not conceive of the possibility of a vaccine doing harm. A lot of my work is informed by my patient contacts, and I've never come across a patient that's been vaccine injured or even known of anybody that's been vaccine injured. And with that in mind, I could not conceive of a problem that the COVID vaccine would cause an issue. I was a little bit skeptical about the benefits I was also by that stage realizing that, you know, I think COVID itself was a big, bigger issue for the elderly and vulnerable and, and not really much of an issue for people younger than 70 beyond it being a bad flu. So I was also aware of that, but um, I didn't think there would be any harm. I took two doses of the COVID vaccine. I went on Good Morning Britain a month later to say that it was um, likely to be safe. And, um, you know, six months later, my father, unfortunately, suffered an unexpected sudden cardiac arrest. His post-mortem oh, findings didn't make sense. He had severe blockages in his coronary arteries. Several months, again, I didn't link the vaccine at that point, but several months later, we then had a publication showing a plausible mechanism is that the mRNA vaccine, specifically Pfizer and Moderna, causes inflammation of the coronary arteries, which means even if you've got a bit of mild furring, it can cause an acceleration of coronary artery disease. And at that point, I realized that if this was likely to be even partially true, we're going to have a lot of people who several months, even a year or two after having had the COVID vaccine, would suddenly present unexpectedly or prematurely with a heart attack or a cardiac arrest. I then, at that point, when I looked into this um, a bit further, I then published a, a paper in the Journal of Insulin Resistance, peer-reviewed, to try and break, break down the benefits and harms. And ultimately, Karen, um, what people need to realize is just one, there's lots of data. In fact, there's, there's you know, showing there is not rare and quite, you know, relatively um, certainly compared to other traditional vaccines, common serious harms, um, whether it's pharmacovigilance data, whether it's observational data, whether it's clinical data, whether it's autopsy data. But the most important bit of data is a randomized controlled trial. So Pfizer and Moderna's trial was reanalyzed by independent scientists, published in the Journal of Vaccine in the summer of last year. It should have been world news, but obviously for a lot of reasons it wasn't, including the fact that Pfizer made $100 billion in profit from this particular product. And of course, it's been um, not just rolled out by governments around the world, but it's actually gone to the state where we've coerced and mandated people, which was extremely unethical. But what I did in that paper was able to at least break down the, the benefits and harms. But the one bit of data that uh, I mentioned earlier, which I think should have been enough to stop the vaccine rollout, was that reanalysis, which showed that from the very beginning, the vaccine was likely to cause more serious harm or more harm than good. In, in other words, you are more likely in the randomized trial to suffer a serious adverse event that means hospitalization, disability, or life-changing event, then you were to be hospitalized with COVID. Which means for me, you know, if this is, um, if this is um, accurate and it appears to be, then um, it should never have been approved for a single human in the first place. That's absolutely criminal, Asim. 
So what do we do now? I mean, why, why, why was this done? Well, to be honest, Karen, it was, um, I'm going to highlight my paper. This was all in many ways predictable. So because we'd not sorted out the system failures before in terms of lack of transparency with clinical trial data, um, everything was set up for this to go wrong um, with the vaccine. And this is what happened. So what it's done is expose the worst failings in the system, but we should use this as an opportunity to change the system. And because the vaccine has affected everybody in the world, whether you yeah. took it or not, right, whether policy is ready to travel yeah. or whatever else, I think this is, you know, we should see this as a wonderful opportunity to capture hearts and minds to help people understand how we got it wrong, why we got it wrong, and and, and how, what we do moving forward. And I've covered a lot of that in my in my articles in the Journal of Interventions, which is open access, people can read it. How do we move forward? Uh, we remove co commercial conflicts of interest over clinical decision making, very simple. Medical knowledge is under commercial control. We need that to not be the case. And if we do that, then people are gonna get a better deal, better information from their doctors, better quality care, better health. So what I'm hearing you saying is you are not an anti-vax clinician yeah, you are a yeah. ethical evidence-based clinician yeah i'm pro transparency i'm pro democracy i'm pro ethical evidence-based medicine okay. um, but you see in this space one of the things that happens the corporations have a big a playbook where in order to keep exerting their power they have one of their tactics is something called opposition fragmentation so if there are people who are basically calling out their bullshit then they will do smears they will use the media um, you know, th there's all sorts of stuff going around the internet about me, which again is almost certainly coming from people vested interests, which does unfortunately have an effect. Um, it does it does influence people's opinions. Um, I'm doing this attention seeking. Uh, I'm earning twenty thousand dollars a talk. Um, so then it's created amongst a certain people who aren't fully awake and maybe have a cognitive bias because they supported the vaccine rollout. It becomes easier for them to paint me as a bad guy. And unfortunately, this is what happens. So this is nothing new here, Karen. I mean, one of the no. things that people should, um, you know, we learn from history. Many people don't know that Martin Luther King was the most hated man in America before he was killed. Do you know why? Not because of his civil rights uh, advocacy, for which no. he got the Nobel Peace Prize, by the way, because he, he was one of the first public figures to call out the Vietnam War. And he was accused of treason in the press. Some of his own friends turned on him and he went into clinical depression. So this is, these tactics have been there before. They've been used very effectively. There's nothing new here. Um, but for me, you know, the truth is more important and you have to grow a rhinoceros hide and a thick skin um, and ultimately realize that this so-called evil in quotes is rooted in ignorance. And what's worse than ignorance is the illusion of knowledge. So it's understanding these psychological barriers to the truth as well um, to try and help people understand what the situation is. Because uh, the facts are still the facts. And if we, we can't bury our heads in the sand, because if we do, the pharmaceutical industry's business model, which is essentially fraud, and they're psychopathic in the way they conduct business, is only going to get more and more, it's only going to get worse. You know, they're now using this as an opportunity to see themselves as the savior of humanity, save millions of lives. They're using that PR to basically now see it as an opportunity to expand the use of more drugs to more people. Um, you know, I debated the CEO of AstraZeneca in 2019 in the Cambridge University Union. And the, the motion was we need more new drugs. But effectively, that motion was saying we need more people taking more drugs. That's their business model. So they will All get right. away with as much as they can to exert their power for the purposes of profit. We need to stop them. Absolutely. And that's what you have been doing. You have always looked at putting patient health before private profit, right? That is one of the first things that I yeah. would really say. Karen, absolutely. But the thing is, people don't realize that the neoliberal economic model that we have at the moment, the brainchild of which was a, a, an economist called Mil Milton Friedman, he himself said it was it, it's immoral. Wait for this. It is immoral for big corporations to put people before profits. Uh, yet they do that. That's the only thing they do. It's, and in the healthcare industry, where, where the most people suffer and the most people are so desperate. It's really fucking sad. Excuse my language. Yeah. Oh, it's horrific. It's absolutely horrific. But I think the way forward, actually, rather than, you know, anger has some positive roles sometimes if it motivates you to do good things. But I think the way forward really is through compassionate courage is is being able to bridge a gap between, um, you know, people who are less aware and people maybe are fully awake. And that's the only way forward because the energy of anger only breeds destruction. And that also isn't good because the more polarized we get as a society, the, the easier it is for these entities to exert their power. We have to come together. Ultimately, democracy means people power. And we are the people that have the real power to solve these problems. I love that. Um, you 
earlier when we were talking, you were talking, you, you said two quotes that were absolutely phenomenal. Can you repeat both of them? The one was Jordan Peterson. The other one was about insanity. Oh yeah. So uh, Jordan Peterson says, and I agree with him entirely, it's not safe to speak the truth, but it's even less safe to not speak the truth because the problem's only going to get worse as you go forward. Brilliant. The other quote is, um, knowledge without action is vanity. Action without knowledge is insanity, but wisdom without courage is fruitless. Okay. Let's move on to your, I'm so excited for this. October 28th, San Jose Civic Center. We are going to be there, you and me. Well, me just in your shadow, but I am, you are talking with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and Dr. Drew and Dr. Vandana Shiva. Okay. And you are talking about ending corruption and chronic disease, right? Can yeah, you that's the title of the event. More? Yeah, well, Robert Kennedy Jr. I've got to know over the last um, almost a year now. Uh -huh. uh, interestingly, when I published my paper in the Journal of Insulin Resistance, he was one of the first people to call me. And uh, I met him uh, in California at the end of last year. Um, I was very uh, impressed with him. Very articulate man. Uh, genuinely very compassionate person. Um, understands the issues probably better than anyone in terms of why America has regressed, if you like, from being probably... I would say considered the moral authority of the world in the world in, in the 1960s, but sadly, two big events. Uh, in fact, a, a number of assassinations of these sort of key political figures that were leading the country in the right direction happened. That was J John F. Kennedy. It was his brother, unfortunately, um, RFK's dad, Robert Kennedy Sr., and then of course Martin Luther King were all killed in the 60s. And I think that then led the United States down a path where the Vietnam War, you know, caused a lot of um, unrest um, and uh, an increasing corporatized country, I think, which was exacerbated by um, the neoliberal economic policies of Ronald Reagan and then and then continued on by George Bush Sr., George Bush Jr., even the Clintons. Um, so th this is really, you know, he's, for me, he's the one person that is able to understand the root cause of the problem, where it started. But then what he says is, and I'm very happy to support him on this, is to restore the United States as being a moral authority in the world. I love that. And once again, this is not about being anti-vax, right? Because it's so easy to sling mud and just focus on that. But like, let's really focus on the solution here. Yeah, I think this anti-vax term has been weaponized deliberately by these interests to try and stop people even listening yep. to Robert Kennedy Jr. Or even it's been thrown at me. Yeah, um, It's a deliberate smear tactic. I just said to people, even if they're a little bit taken aback by that, just come and listen. Um, come and actually spend a few hours listening to myself speak to Robert Kennedy Jr., to Vandana Shiva. Um, come with an open mind uh, because, you know, you're not going to be able to, you know, and if at the end of all of that, you still think that your view is correct or you've heard enough and it's not um, changed your opinion, fine. I think it's very unlikely that's going to happen. Uh, you know, I, I very much follow one of my inspirations is Socrates, uh, the Greek philosopher, and he said, true wisdom comes only from dialogue. You know, I, no. I my mindset, uh, Karen, is when I approach a conversation with anybody, and I see that, I, and I actually take this even from my patient contact, is at the end of a conversation with someone, you should both end up wiser. That should be the purpose of a conversation, ideally, right? You know, that's what it's about. So I think we need to think, uh, change our mindset. Um, and that means that left needs to talk to right because the problems facing the world are affecting everybody now. Um, and I think even for people who are in positions of power, we don't live in cocoons, you know? Um, you can't lead a happy life while the world around you is burning. So I think... It's in everybody's self-interest to put the community interest first. I think if we put, if everybody thinks from a mindset of societal interest, indirectly, that means we're serving our self-interest. If we put self-interest first, then I think the community interest can often go the wrong direction. I love this. Okay. Is this open to the and public? it's ultimately self-destructive. It's all, I think about this rationally. It's not about courage. I think about this rationally as well, Karen. It's yeah. ultimately self-destructive. <sighs> okay. This is open to the public, right? How do we find information? Completely. How do join? Okay. How do we? Yeah, how, how, you, do, how do we join? Yeah, yeah. If you just um, if you just Google San Jose Civic, um, you know, and put in my name into Google, twenty uh, eighth October event. If you just remember those things. It'll come up to a link, and you should be able to um, purchase a live stream. This is also not for profit. None of us are earning any money for this. Um, the person that's originally put the money down very kindly is a philanthropist, a wealthy Australian called Adrian McRae. Um, he's actually paid the money for the venue. So, of course, we he wants to at least break even and make that money back from the ticket sales. And anything extra 
um, is going to be given to charity, which is yet to be determined, but it's been probably a charity of Robert Kennedy Jr.'s choice. I love that, Asim. Um, I will also post the link in my bio and below so that anybody who wants to join can. Um, yeah, thank you so much, my friend. I'm so grateful and I can't wait to see you.